a junior church, and the kids were so good. The church there has something for you to come by and get it. You don't leave a rabbit laying around. Yeah. You, know, you see somebody drop a map, you can make sure you pick it up. I haven't had Hershey's Kisses to give the kids in almost a month. It's been a hard life. <laughs> oh, you too? Okay. They were really good in the service this morning. Did y'all notice that? Probably didn't notice that they were so good. Please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. They really were excellent. And, uh, really appreciate the effort that many of you adults make in teaching children how to behave in, in the church house. It really... Um, really something that I guess we don't give a lot of thought to sometimes, and it's something that is extremely, extremely important is just to teach people how to behave. And, uh, you know, a lot of adults don't know how to behave because we don't have really a culture of people that uh, go to church. And I, I think sometimes, uh, while you turn to First Corinthians 5, I'll just ramble, uh, sometimes we do so many things without thinking about it. We're not purposeful in a lot of what we do, uh, but we really ought to not just use terms and uh, be really careful what terms we use and also be thoughtful and purposeful in our services and how we worship. I was thinking just a minute ago uh, how that uh, Brother Taj said we're going to have a special. I wonder what would somebody that had never been to church before uh, anticipate if we said remain seated, we're going to have a special. Uh, thinking, man, maybe it's like the blue light of Kmart. Or, hey, we, just, we just say things a lot of times, don't we? We just... We just I don't even think about it. But what's that? Nobody's gonna know what that is. I know. I nobody. You know, honestly, if I came to church for the first time and they said we're gonna have a special, I don't know what that would mean. And there are honestly churches that I think many individuals would be intimidated to attend simply or merely because of the reality that uh, just some of the things that are said and done are just so foreign or strange that it's just really awkward. Well, thanks for being here this morning. If you're in First Corinthians chapter five, I want to go ahead and uh, look down to verse. Let's just read verse 9 through 13, and we'll pray, and then we'll establish our context and get into our message this morning, which I believe will be a real help for us. Verse 9, the Scripture reads, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now... I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from yourselves, from among yourselves, that wicked person. So Father, I pray that you would help us as we, even as we look at this portion of the Scripture, really get the understanding of what you're teaching us. And then, Lord, I pray for practical application that would help us to understand holiness and biblical separation in this practical sense. We pray in Jesus' name, for His sake. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of a series, if you haven't been with us, we're in a series on biblical Bible separation. And when we talked about separation initially, I think we all agreed that the word... Uh, needs a little bit of uh, help as far as image polishing. The word separation, or the words together, biblical separation, in the church just have a negative connotation, don't they? In other words, there would be many people I could stand. As a matter of fact, I actually preached uh, the first message. I preached in Tennessee at a church last week, and I just said to the church, I said, biblical separation. And one person said, amen. And I said, biblical separation separation! And they all said, Amen! So they were for it. I guess. But honestly, what a lot of people mean when they say biblical separation is exclusion. And exclusion actually isn't really positive, is it? In most, in most uh, uh, contexts. Now, if we were to say exclusion of cancer cells. Positive or negative? Uh, Exclusion of, I mean, there would be things that you would want to separate from, wouldn't there? In a quarantine concept, you know, get that thing separated from. Uh, but a lot of times we think in terms of Christianity and in terms of being believers and in, in 
reference to those individuals who don't know Jesus as their Savior who are lost, we think of biblical separation as a concept of excluding others, right? Separating ourselves. And oftentimes it's thought of along with a notion of self-righteousness or piety, isn't it? I mean, honestly, why do we exclude somebody? Why do we not fellowship with somebody? Well, because they're sinners, right? In other words, you know, we're not supposed to eat with this type of a person because they're wicked, they're sinners, and so we're excluding ourselves from them because we're not like them. And when we actually began our series on biblical separation, one of the things we learned is that actually we are like the sinners. And that the motive behind separating uh, from separation, before we define how it's done, how it's actually practiced, actually has nothing to do with our being different than sinners. And so we were in Isaiah chapter 6 several weeks ago, and we saw Isaiah early on in his ministry accounting how that in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. He said, I saw the Lord, and, and his description of the Lord was that he was high and lifted up. And he said about the Lord, he said his train filled the temple. Now we'd understand train not like the choo-choo going down the tracks, but we would understand train... Uh, like a bride's dress. Y'all ever seen a bride that had like a, I mean a train, like where you know she's squeezing between the aisles as she goes down because you know her train is sweeping behind her, or she comes up the steps, you know. And I mean, I guess this is like every bride's, you know, not every bride's dream, but a lot of brides want this presentation. They come up the steps, you know, and their train, you know, just kind of flows up the steps like a big old carpet behind them and uh, like a peacock in his feathers, or I don't know what it's supposed to be like with them. And then the, the, you know, the, the best lady, or the, what do they call her, the bride, not the bridesmaid, the, the maid of honor. most eligible, maid of honor. Uh, oh, maid of honor, thank you. Okay, <laughs> the maid of honor takes her train and sets it up behind, spreads it out, you know, and here she is on the platform, and you know, the preacher's having to, you know, get around, you know, to get, make sure he doesn't step on it. And that, that's like the maid of honor's job, right, to arrange the train. Anyway, but the idea of train in Isaiah chapter 6 is God's presence. I mean, literally His holiness, His train, His presence just fills the room, fills the temple, the holy place. And I have the, I have the idea that this is a large place, high ceilings. Uh, you know, we have these, uh, we have these uh, seraphim, they're flying in, around in, in, in the throne room. And they're certainly at least the size of a man, probably much larger and they, they are these angelic beings that have two wings that they cover their face, two wings they cover their feet, and two wings they're flying with, and they're screaming, they're crying, holy, holy, holy. And so there's this, then there's smoke that's filling the room, and it's not a smoke generator, you know, like five minutes till service starts and smoke starts coming out, you know, or something. No, it's like God's presence, like literally smoke from His presence. And when they're crying, the Bible says, when, they're, when the seraphim are crying, holy, 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 the Bible says that literally the pillars shook. Now, I can't imagine a place constructed by God shaking, but I mean literally like, like thunder. Uh, you know, literally this voice is just shaking things. And this is an impressive sight. And when Isaiah saw this, his response was to say, Woe is me. And woe means alas or oh. I, I, he said, I'm undone. Literally, he's just collapsing. I see in my mind's eye as Isaiah sees God high and lifted up and he sees himself. Isaiah just literally loses his ability to stand and just falls on his face. And he says, oh, I'm undone. He says, for I am a man of unclean lips. And that's separation. So he said, God is high and he's lifted up and he's holy. And I'm low like a worm. And I am unholy. I'm unclean. Holy and unclean. The greatest contrast that there can be, God and us. And then he said, I am identified with those that are unclean. He said, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My friend, understanding biblical separation at its inception is the first of all an understanding that God is holy and we're not. And that we have far more in common with individuals who are unholy than those who are holy. 
the notion of any person separating from another person on the basis of their own merit, worth, holiness, or self-righteousness, my friend, is absolutely ludicrous. The idea that you or I can ever be better than an unclean person because, because I go to church three times a week or because I dress different or because I don't do this or I do this. The notion that somehow we separate from somebody on the basis of what we do is such a contradiction of Isaiah's understanding of separation. But when he saw God high and lifted up, he said, God's different than me and I'm separated with Him and I'm identified with unholy people. And then one of the seraphim took tongs or the idea is like a snuffer and he, he took a coal from the altar and he came and he touched Isaiah's lips and he said, Lo, this hath cleansed you. This has made you clean. This has cleansed you. Cleaned your lips. And now you're cleansed. And now because of what was done to Isaiah, he's clean. And no longer has to say, woe is me, I'm undone when he sees a holy God. Now the separation between him and God is closed in. There's no separation between him and God. And my friend, that's a picture of Jesus and the cross. Listen, you may this morning uh, be in, the, in, in this place and have some sort of notion that maybe because of an organization that you were part of when you were born, maybe you were born into a church, maybe you were baptized or sprinkled uh, with water, uh, identifying you with a church or with a family, or maybe uh, you'd attended, or maybe you'd done good works or gone through confirmation, or maybe you've been baptized. Maybe there's something you've done. Maybe something you've continually or consistently done, and that is what makes you not separated from God. I've had people tell me all kinds of reasons why they do not think that God, who is holy, should judge themselves or that He should overlook the reality that they are, like all of us, sinners. And many people say, you know what, I've always been a good person. Well, my friend, there, there's no notion that is more contradictory than that in the world. The fact of the matter is, is that no person has ever always been a good person. And no judge judges good. A judge only judges evil or sin. God does not judge us for our righteousness or for our good works. God judges us for our sin. And so, no person will stand before God and have holy God in heaven say something like, well, you're so good. No, my friend. God says, this is what you've done. What was us? Jesus was God's perfect Son. He came to this earth, born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. And Jesus lived like no man ever has before because He lived in a sin-cursed, corrupt earth without sinning. And He did miracles that on a continual daily basis proved beyond doubt to everyone, including those who would not receive Him, that He was God. And then Jesus went willingly to the cross and died for sin. He did not die for His sin because He had never sinned. But Jesus went to the cross and died for your sin and for my sin. He took our place in substitution. And He made it so that the separation between ourselves and holy God in heaven by simply calling on the name of the Lord could be done away with. So that we could have a relationship with God. Matter of fact, and, and He made it easy. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, I did that when I was a child. I called on the name of the Lord and the separation that separated me from God. It was eliminated. And I've had, I have been God's child ever since. I've had the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we find Isaiah here in Isaiah chapter 6. You're not there. I'm just trying to get into our context this morning. We find that Isaiah recognizes that based on what he is and based on what God is, that they're opposites or they're separated. But now he has been cleansed, his lips have been clean, and then the Lord says, Who will go for us and whom shall I send? And we know that famous passage of Scripture, a lot of times people are talking about call to ministry and so forth, and, and uh, Isaiah said, Lo, here am I, send me. Right? We have a song, Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord, so he said, Here am I, send me. He longed to do the will of the Lord. So he said, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Everywhere for thee. Y'all know this, right? You sang in junior church? 
And some of y'all know this. Okay, well, anyway, I won't make you sing. I should make you sing it this morning. Some of you are about to fall asleep. Uh, but that's because I'm boring. So I'll try to stop being boring, and then you can wake back up. So wake up, and I'll do my best from here on out. Well, so I, we, the, we sing the song about Isaiah being sent, but we ignore the context. And the context is that God is holy, Isaiah is wicked, and God's holiness separates him from Isaiah. And then a coal from the fire cleanses his lips, and now Isaiah has been made to be holy, and now he's no longer separated from God. But when he is separated, or when he's no longer separated from God, what does that separate him from then? What? Okay, from sin? Other people. From, other from other unclean people, right? Before, Isaiah is different than God and the same as unclean people. Now, because of what God has done, Isaiah is different from unclean people and like God. Now, friend, it is not being arrogant. It is not taking something upon ourselves to say that as Christians we are holy because we have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ and we are holy. We are a holy people, a holy generation, not because of our works, but because of what God has done on our behalf. And our holiness now separates us from those that are unclean. Now we read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning, and I would like to read it again. And I'd like to look at this morning the truth that a believer is to be separated, not isolated. Okay, let's say it together. I know it sometimes seems childish, but it does help us to remember some things. So we're going to say a believer is to be separated, not isolated. Ready? Here we go. A believer is to be separated, not isolated. Let's say it again. A believer is to be separated, not isolated. Now, I joke sometimes about believers that you know have this monastic type of a mentality. That is, I'm going to be holy. And by the way, sometimes we do need to separate ourselves from some circumstances or things in our environments, don't we, that are, that are a downfall or stumbling block from us. Let me give you a couple for instances. I told you we're going to go to our text, but we're going to wait just a minute. Let me give you a couple for instances. Um, I don't know what I do with my cell phone. Did I throw it away? Oh, there it is. Okay, I think about throwing my cell phone away, but I haven't yet. Uh, you know, this thing's a real problem for a lot of people, isn't it? Yeah. You tell me some things that are a problem with this thing. Time's going on too much. Okay, was time waster? Is that what you said? I think it was exactly what you said, wasn't it? It's a time waster a lot of times. Anybody here ever waste time because of a smartphone? Now, some of you perfect people, I'm, I am so thankful to know you so I can emulate you. But the reality, this thing's a, a real time waster, isn't it, sometimes? You know, what are some other problems with this thing? I hate, here's what I hate about this thing. I did this this morning. I was with the teenagers. We go over to Safeway and we buy donuts before Sunday school class. And I'm with the teenagers and I needed to make a phone call to somebody that I've been waiting a week to speak with. And so I called them while I was waiting on the kids to get donuts, but I was still talking to him while I'm checking out. Isn't that rude? And doesn't it bother you when you're trying to talk to somebody and, you know, they got the thing in their ear or, or you're in a room? Try this. On the way to camp last week, one of the biggest battles we had was taking cell phones away from our teenagers. We, they should have been taken before we left on the trip, but some of them were on the trip somehow. And it was just a battle last week. And one of the things uh, that, that it really destroys a teen trip is when our kids aren't together because they're somewhere else. They're in a game, or they're... You ever gone to visit your niece or your nephew or something like that, or a family member, and you just want to spend time with them, maybe play a fun game or interact with them, get to know them? They're playing some game on a tablet or an iPhone or something like that. And then the worst thing is when adults do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Isn't, I mean, it's just these things make people rude. I don't like cell phones because they're a time waster. I don't like cell phones. I'm mean, going to just smash this thing. How much y'all pay me to smash my phones? No. Uh, I don't like them because of the way people act, and, I, and myself included. I mean, we were coming back from Miami Beach a few weeks ago in the church bus, and there was a cell phone sticker that said something like, you know, the you know, text equals RAP, or, or maybe said something like, don't text and drive. And as we pulled up next to it, the lady in the car is just, just going at it, talking to somebody. It was really funny. I told everybody, hey, everybody, look at this bumper sticker. Now look at this lady. So she's got a bumper sticker that says don't text and drive, and she's sitting in the car texting like crazy while she's driving. And I, and I observed it a lot 
uh, on our road trip home yesterday just how many people are texting while I'm driving by them. You know, that's dangerous. I, there's no perfect people. I'm, sometimes I have to uh, text while I'm in the vehicle. I mean, I'm required to. I'm kidding you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're, they're bad for that reason. Uh, pornography, I mean, I'll tell you, you're not looking for it and it comes at you on any computer or any device and the ability just to access things that are, that are terrible. See, it hurts. I mean, it's just, it's prolific. It's so prolific. And, man, if you're a parent, don't give your kids smartphones. You're a fool if you, if you give your children a smartphone. And if you're an adult, don't have a smartphone without accountability. It's just you're foolish if you do. You know, your husbands and wives, you need to have access. You need to be able to read each other's texts, read each other's emails, uh, look at each other's Internet history and that sort of thing, or, or just grab it away and say, what are you looking at sometime? Just, and it shouldn't bother you. It shouldn't bother you if somebody says, what are you doing? And grabs your smartphone, you ought to just say, oh, you can look at it or you can join in or whatever. I think that that's, that's smart huh, for, for a, a device. But anyway, these devices, they're really a problem sometimes, aren't they? And, uh, you know, I've met pastors that have flip phones. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, more and more I envy them. Just because of the time wasting and then the fact that I, I am expected to always be accessible by email, by text, or by phone. And people are offended if I'm not. I mean, really, it's, it's the truth. People know I can be available, so if I'm not, it bothers them that I'm not. Sometimes I just want to just, I'm right in the middle of something, and somebody calls me, and you can't just call them back. They, they hang up, and they call again, and they hang up, and they call again, and they hang up. They're like, I know you're not answering. I know you can answer. You know, they keep, and I just want to just throw that thing away. And uh, so I, I know pastors that have flip phones. I know men that have struggled with things they look at. And so they, they carry flip phones. You just have a flip phone, or they don't have a phone because of it. And you know something? I think that's great. I don't think, any, I don't think anything except that that's commendable to any person that says, you know what, I decided not to have that because it's a downfall for me. It makes me rude. It makes me waste time. Or it leads me into temptation. And so I don't have them. And if somebody does that, I don't think, well, I mean, you think... You know, you think that uh, everybody needs to do that. That's one of the things that bothers us if we get convicted about something somebody else does. It bothers us they do something because we think, well, you think everybody has to do that. I don't think everybody has to do that, but I think it's a pretty good idea. It's a pretty good idea for a lot of us. If you ever see me without a smartphone, you see me with a flip phone or whatever, it's because I made the determination, you know, it's best for me not to have that thing. And sometimes I've got to separate myself from things. Okay. Now, I said all that to say this, to help us to understand something. Removing things out of our lives sometimes is necessary for us to reflect holiness. Right? In other words, <laughs> I, don't, I think it's still under our bed. Our television's under the bed in our guest room at home right now. Now, I don't remember why it's... Uh, there was a reason why it got moved there and then just got put under the bed instead of being put back in the living room. But <laughs> we got it out to, to watch something the other day and we put it back. Uh, I, I'm not making rules for people. I'm not saying, you shouldn't have a television in your living room or whatever. But we've just found out that if you turn that thing on, it's either a time waster or blasphemous. Either, bla either they, people take the name of the Lord their, my God in vain in my living room or say something, I mean, just in a commercial, they just bring something inappropriate that I don't want in my home. And so I just, I'm not saying you need to do that. I just, for, for Melissa and I, it's, it's just, well, we don't have time for that. We're too busy. We don't have time for that thing anyway. If I need to watch something, I can watch it on a, on a, uh, a computer or something like that. I just don't need it to be, you know, the centerpiece in our home. And so we don't have it. Uh, I know people that don't have a television at all. There's people in this church. They just don't even own a television. And, man, that's commendable. I think it's a great thing. Uh, some people should own a television that do because of the time that wastes or the things that it brings into your mind or, or the uh, indoctrination, that sort of thing that comes along. That's, if, you, if you don't agree with that, if you say, well, that's not a problem for me, wonderful. Sometimes separation is practically, I can't have this in my life because it causes me to sin. You understand what I'm saying? That's all I'm trying to say. I, I remember when I was a teenager struggling with music uh, and really struggling with friends listening to music in my vehicle that I just, I mean, it was a real battle for me. It was really hard for me to say, you know what, that's, that's ungodly. That's godless, and I don't need to hear that in my vehicle. 
And, and I just really didn't have the courage to say, you know what, guys, we don't want to listen to that. When people turn my stereo on, I remember I took my stereo out of my truck. Just took it out. My friend got in, where's your stereo? I took it out. That was easier than arguing with him about what to listen to. Just took it out of my truck. And it helped me. It was just a helpful thing. You say, that's extreme, Pastor. I know, I'm extreme. <laughs> I realize that. But you know, holiness is kind of extreme, isn't it? Sin is extremely dangerous, deadly, and God's holiness is the opposite of sin, and we are holy. Not because of what we've done, but we have been made to be holy, and we're supposed to live like we're holy. And we saw that a couple of weeks ago. Now, there are Christians who are isolationist. They say, you know something? Everything and everybody's bad. <laughs> I, I can't talk to you because you're bad. And uh, I can't go around you because you're bad. And I understand that I understand. You know, somebody struggles with uh, drunkenness or uh, being an addict, addicted to something. You're crazy if you struggle with drinking and you go to a bar. You're crazy if you go to a bar anyway. But you're crazy if you think that you can, that you struggle with drinking and you can hang around people that are drinking. Aren't you? People that are drinking are not okay with someone not drinking around them. I know sometimes they say, oh, I really support you. You know, I don't agree with what you're doing, but I really support what you're doing. I think it's good for you. They don't mean that at all. You make them feel bad by not drinking. And they want you to drink, and they're going to try to get you to drink. And if, if you say, well, just, just one, you know, whatever, they're going to give you one. Why? Because they want you. Why do people push drugs? Why does someone who's not a drug dealer want their friend to try drugs? You ever ask that question? Why, why, do, why is there so much peer pressure in doing drugs? Do you validate yourself? You do drugs and you're like me and I don't feel badly about it. And so I under, understand some of, these, some of these concepts about separation. If you struggle with drugs and you're going to hang around people that do drugs, you're not going to have victory in that area in your life, are you? You're called to be holy. And if you don't separate yourself from that... But here's, here's a question. I want to say I've never drank an alcoholic beverage in my life, but I have, actually. Uh, a couple of months ago, I went to a wedding, and they, <laughs> they had ices. They had a bar. They were drinking. People were drinking. And they had an icy machine, and they, it, it had, like, lemonade ices. And I went and tried one. It was on Cinco de Mayo. And I, what was it? Uh, I tasted. It was sour. It was, it was just rotten. I threw it away. But it was like, it was, what is it? The uh, margarita? It was a margarita. I drank something like that, an icy margarita. So I have drank alcohol, folks. I'm publicly confessing. <laughs> I have drank alcohol. Okay. Uh, I threw I tasted it. And, and the embarrassing thing about it was, I, right in front of everybody, I went over and got me one. You know, put this icy thing in a cup. I'm like, that looks good. It's hot outside. Oh, this could be refreshing. And I tasted it. It was rotten. So right in front of everybody, I grabbed it and I threw it in the trash. Just in front of everybody. That way they knew, hey, I didn't drink that on purpose. And uh, I got after the people had the wedding. I said, y'all set me up. You know, you, you tricked me with that thing. They said, well, you know, we're just, we didn't really, really know. Whatever. Anyway, my point is this. I can't say I've never drank alcohol. I don't think I swallowed. But <laughs> I sound like Bill Clinton, don't I? Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know. <laughs> Some of y'all are too young to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. But the reality of it is, is that I don't struggle with drinking alcohol. I, I believe what the Bible says. It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I believe what the Bible says. And, the Bible, and if you think... Well, you know, it's not a problem. The Bible says, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. In other words, it's a really, really nice way of calling you a fool if you don't agree with God about that. And so that's been my position. But more than that, I just hate the stuff. My dad, when I was growing up, used to try to help alcoholics. And the things they did to themselves and to their families, to their children, and to me made me hate alcohol. I just hate the stuff. There's nothing good about it. And if you are sucked into that uh, notion of believing that there's something good about it, my friend, there isn't. It'll never help you. It'll only hurt you. There's just nothing good about it. I don't struggle with it. And I'll be honest with you, I can hang around drunks. I can, go, I can go down to a park where a bunch of guys are drinking and I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and not be tempted one bit to drink with them. Remember uh, some guys down the street. From, I, I told the story about the guys next door. We were building the fence a few weeks ago. They went and bought us beer. It was really nice. They went and bought us cold beer, like expensive beer. 
uh, and brought it over and said, hey guys, you know, here you go, and gave us beer. And they, they honestly, they were just being kind. They weren't, they were just being nice. It just never occurred to them that we didn't drink. And I said, thank you very, very much, but we don't drink. And he just said, well, more for me. And he went and put it in his fridge, and then he went and bought us ginger ale, and uh, like a nice ginger uh, ginger ale. And that was a kind gesture. And you'd say, Pastor, well, that wasn't very nice. You're not to drink their beer. No, I, I didn't offend them at all, to be honest with you. They just realized, okay, there's something different about him. He doesn't drink. Now, it, it wasn't, I'm better than you. You understand the difference between separation? In other words, I'm holy. And I need to live and act like I'm holy, but I don't need to be an isolationist about holiness. If some guy's drinking a beer, I'll walk up to him and preach the gospel. I'm still separated, right? You understand? In other words, separation has clearly defined lines. But if I walk up and say, hey guys, give me a beer and let's talk about the Jesus. There's blurred lines, aren't there? See the difference? Now, I want to look at just some concepts, some truth, and I want to just... just um, support this, and I want to help us to understand how a believer is supposed to be in the world and not of the world. Okay, so here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, finally. Paul said in verse 9, he said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany, or not to company with fornicators, and then he said, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. There are many fornicators that I'm praying for, and I'm sharing the gospel with as a pastor. Uh, it's a man that, while my neighbors are out of town, he's a caretaker of, of their home, and he's a homosexual. He's in a homosexual marriage. It's not really. God doesn't acknowledge that. But he that's the relationship that he's in. And he knows exactly what I am. He knows that I'm a pastor, that I'm a Christian. And he also knows that I love him and care about him. Matter of fact, when he's bothered or upset about something, he comes and asks me to pray for him. And he asked me for things. I mean, he just comes and says, would you pray for me? You know, I'm, this is just terrible, and so on and so forth. And I share the gospel with him. He knows. He knows that his relationship is sin. He doesn't need me to say, your relationship's wicked, you know, and I would never do that. Well, no, listen, friend, it isn't about me. I'm wicked. He's wicked. We're both sinners. What he needs is Jesus. And for me to be a pastor and a preacher of the gospel... And for him to know me in that sense, listen, there's plenty of separation between us. And the Bible doesn't say, you're homosexual, I'll never speak to you. Listen, I, I, I've seen that culture in Christianity. Christianity has failed to help the hurting. And I'll tell you, anyone who's in a wicked lifestyle, whether it's just adultery, whether it's a couple who aren't married living together as though they are or treating each other in a way that only married people are allowed to treat each other, whether it's that or whether it's homosexuality, it's all sin. And as a believer, they don't need me to say you're wicked and to isolate myself from them or withdraw myself from them. They need me as a believer to say, you know, I'm wicked, but Jesus saved me and He can save you. And I've seen God do that in so many instances, haven't you? And so... Paul is telling the church at Corinth, he's dealing with in this passage of Scripture with something really terrible that's happened in the church. And this is so terrible that actually people that weren't part of the church, weren't even Israel and under the law, said that's just terrible. A man was in a relationship with his father's wife. Now, I've had people try to help me with some cultural understanding. It was his stepmom, not his actual. I don't care what it was. A man in a relationship with his father's wife Anybody here want to argue for it? You want to go somewhere with normal people like your workplace and argue for it? It's natural, normal, and healthy. No, it's wicked. In other words, people that were okay with wickedness said, that's bad. That's terrible. And the church was kind of like, well, mm, yeah, we don't necessarily agree with it, but it's, they just didn't do anything about it. And so now people are looking at the church and saying, you know the people in that church, there's some messed up people. There's a guy there that's in a relationship with his dad's wife, and that's bad. that is unsaved people. People that were not saved by the grace of God looked at them and said, man, you all are messed up. That's bad. And Paul, in this letter, has written a scathing response to the church at Corinth, and he has spared no, no words, no... Uh, he, has, he has not pulled any punches in how he's dealt with it. He said, it's terrible. 
And he said, you need to deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, when I come, I'll deal with it. And I'll turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Of course, he cannot be under the umbrella of God's blessing of the church. He can't be part of that body. And in that kind of sin, you've got to kick him out of the church. And he said, you know, don't treat him altogether you know, like he's, he's lost, but treat him like a brother that's in sin. And now verse 9, Paul is qualifying what he said. He said, now I told you about that wicked person. I want you to kick him out of the church and you don't company with a man that's a Christian, a brother that's a fornicator. You don't, don't have fellowship with him. Don't eat with him. Don't talk to him. You put him out and you have nothing to do with that guy. He's a believer and he's living in sin and you need to separate yourself from him. And then in verse 9, Paul said, but I'm not talking about lost people that are fornicators or covetous or idolaters. Or, and he said, if we were talking about lost people, he said, what I would be saying, verse 9, is that you're to go all together with, you're, you're not to company with the fornicators of this world. Verse 9, he says, the, for, verse 10, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Paul said, I am not telling you to withdraw yourself from the world. Now, Christian, listen to me. An unbiblical application of biblical separation has caused believers to lack any influence on the lost world. We as a church have very little influence on the world because of a misunderstanding of biblical separation. Now, they're, they're drunkards. I'm out of here. They're idolaters. No. They're, they're fornicators. No. There, and we just withdraw ourselves and withdraw ourselves and withdraw ourselves. Now, I have, let, let me give you a for instance of something that, I, that I'm always burdened about. I have never been a proponent of public education, public school education. I don't mean to be offensive to you here today, uh, but, I, but I will tell you the truth. And the truth is, is that, that the public education system in the United States of America is socialistic. It's a, it's, it was established by socialism, the public school was, and the public education system, I'm not saying all the teachers are socialists, I'm just telling you they're part of a social system, a socialist system. But all the teachers in the public uh, education system are socialists. We're not a socialist uh, country, in case you didn't know that. So when FDR established socialism, so the social system in our country back in the 1930s, we had officially a social system of education established in a country that's not socialist. Socialism has failed. Socialism has failed in every experiment. So it's, it's never worked in any country. It only works in countries that have enough capitalism for it to leech off of. And, but the public education system takes something that is a parent's right and duty, which is the education of their children, and makes it the right and duty of the government. Determines what a child should learn, and how he should learn it, and makes it so that a parent doesn't get to choose what his children teach. And if you're a parent and you just send your kids to public school, my friend, you have abdicated a God-given right and duty to educate your children. In other words, you at least ought to have enough thought to say, this is what I want my kids to learn. But if you send your kids to public school, you don't get a choice about that. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not bashing. I'm not picking on anybody that doesn't have a choice about something or whatever. I'm just, just calling it what it is. Okay, so now... Socialism uh, is a real problem. Back in the 1970s, the church identified the fact that they've kicked God out of the public schools. You can't, you can't pray. You can't have teacher-led prayer, teacher-led Bible study. You can't pledge allegiance to the Bible like they used to do in the public schools. Back in the 1960s, uh, they determined that uh, we had Brown, Brown versus Board of Education that it was unconstitutional for us to be Christian in school. So they kicked God out. Christ is out of the school. And a lot of Christians responded by saying, okay, then we're not going to be part of that system. I grew up in the Christian school movement. Uh, a lot of my, my parents' contemporaries were jailed for sending their kids to Christian schools that were church schools instead of government schools. And there was a big battle. Many of you don't remember it or weren't aware of it like we were. But actually, we were in danger of being taken from our parents because our parents educated us instead of letting the public school system educate us back in the 1980s. Literally... Uh, my parents were in danger of being arrested uh, for taking the responsibility of my education. I remember going down uh, with my dad to the, school, the, the head of the school board and when I was in first grade and he had taken third grade, uh, he had taken the, the school's third grade uh, curriculum and my dad had, had me read 
for the man for one of the administrators or one of the school boards and just let him know, hey, my son has a good education. Uh, he's just not going to be part of the socialist system. And Christians really came out of the public school system. And you know what happened? The, the public school system didn't get better in our country when the Christians withdrew. In other words, it didn't become more Christ-like. It became less, didn't it? Uh, you could, it used to be that most of your teachers were Christians. Today, they listen, Anthony had his Bible out in math class a couple years ago. The teacher said, put that away. Did you do that? You can't have that. I didn't know about it. I would have done something about that. But here's what I want to say about that. Any chance I get, I'm going to go into the public school. I wouldn't send my dog to the public school. I would. I'm serious. I don't have a dog either. So I wouldn't send my hypothetical non-existent dog to the public school. I just wouldn't. I'm not bashing anybody. I'm not picking on anybody. Not only because the educational system is terrible and they're teaching you that there's no God and that you're an animal and uh, that they hate your God and they're trying to turn you into a socialist. Not just because of that. It's anti-American. It's anti-God. And I have a problem with that. But I'm still going to go there every chance I get. Shamir's school has a Bible club, and I got invited this year. This year, every Monday that I could, I went to, I went to Shamir's school and we did Bible study with the kids. And I had to do everything I can. I'll go to any school and preach there. And I'll tell you something else. If I've got time and I know about a, a school board meeting or whatever, I know pastor friends that are, that are on the school board. They don't send their kids to public school, but they pay taxes. And they're concerned about what's going on in their community, and they're on the school board. And when something objectionable arises, they do something about it. People say, well, you're not, you don't even send your kids to public school. Yeah, almost no teachers send their kids to public schools either. Check sometime. You go to your public school and ask how many of the teachers let their kids go to public school. They all go to private school. They don't send their kids to public school. That's for your kids. They're not going to let their kids get that level of education. That nonsense. I'm serious. Check on it sometime. You think I'm wrong. You check on it. They, they wouldn't put up with that kind of education for their children. And yet they're part of that system for other people's children. You just think about that for a minute. But as a believer, listen, I'm not, oh, stay away from the public school. I want to get in the public school. I want to preach the gospel there. I want to go meet with the administrator and have lunch with him and pray with him. I want to meet the teachers and I want to pray with them and share the gospel with them. I want to be saved. You understand the difference? In other words, I'm not going to put my kids in a public school. But I'm going to go to the public school and try to reach the kids that are there. And that's the way a Christian is in life. Oh, you know, I'm not going to work a job that has unsaved people. You serious? What job are you going to work? <laughs> I'm not going to shop at a store that isn't Christian. You serious? What store are you going to shop at? I'm not going to patronize an establishment that... Are you serious? And Paul said... You're not to company with a brother that's called a fornicator. He said, but I'm not telling you to go all together out of the world. He said, if you do that, you're going to withdraw from the world. Now let me ask you a question. How much influence does a person who isn't in a place have there? Now, now if I go to the public school and I preach the gospel and I have a Bible study and they say, you support the public school system, what's my answer? I love you, but no. I like you, but no good people. So I'm going to tell you, most of the public school teachers that I know, they're great people. Even the ones that aren't saved, they love kids, they, 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 they've given their lives to serve. They wouldn't send their kids to their school, but they, 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 they're good people, aren't they? And I'll go pray with them. You know, there's a group uh, of independent fundamental Baptists, they go to, it's called the Capitol Connection every year, and they go to the Capitol every year, and they go and just pray with all of the senators, and they try to line up different people from every state to pray with, whether Democrat or Republican or Independent Party, whatever they represent, they go pray with them. And they give them Bibles, and they go in their office, and they've had a really, it's really majorly affected our capital, actually, in the last few years, because of these Christians that are just going, you, just, you know, almost every senator has marital problems. Almost every senator has, uh, has addiction problems. You don't know how many alcohol, drug addicted leaders we have in our country, but it's it's, it's a majority, not a minority. And they're hurting people. And we as believers need to get to them and say, hey, Jesus can help you. Jesus can save you. We can do something for you. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He's saying, listen, you can't have that garbage in the church. He said, but you can go in the world and preach Jesus. Notice verse 11. 
and we'll finish our context. I have a lot more verses I want to read this morning, but I think that this passage really covers the notion that we're trying to get across. Verse 11 says, Now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a fornicator, or I was not called a fornicator, called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. If a believer is a drunkard, and I'm hanging out with him, what do people think I am? A drunkard, right? And it's not about polishing my image. It isn't about me looking good. But the reality of it is it's a bad testimony for me to hang out with Christian drunks. If a believer is a fornicator, that is, he is committing sexual sin. I'm not supposed to hang around him or people think I'm involved with the same things he's involved with. There's a guilt by association there, and I'm not supposed to company with him. The Bible says if he's an extortioner, if he's a crook. Listen, if you're a crook, you can't come to this church. You rip off. We've, we've had it before. We had a guy one time we kicked out of this church. We asked, we'd been, yeah, we kicked him out. We didn't physically kick him, but we put him on the curb. He was staying with a guy in our church, and he made an agreement financially with the guy to help pay rent, and had deliberately never paid the guy rent. Owed him like five or six thousand dollars. He uh, had done some other things to people in the church and ripped them off. It was like ripping off Christians, borrowing money from Christians. Because they're Christians, hey brother, lend me some money. And he was ripping people off because of their relationship as Christians. And you know what I did? I kicked him out. Kicked him out. Later on, he got a job that he lost because they called me. And they said, what about so-and-so? I said, he owes a guy in our church $5,000. And in order to get that job, he had to repay the money. And he was a crook. He was a Christian. He's a crook. And I'm telling you, you can't be a crook. If I hear about you, by the way, if somebody takes advantage of you in this church, don't say that church says, you come tell me about it. You talk to the person about it, you tell me about it. Because we're supposed to deal with things like that in our church. We, we, first of all, if you're, if you're taking advantage of somebody, you're not right with God. And if you're not right with God, you're missing out on fellowship. And you need me to talk to you about it. So you can get right. But if you don't get right, you're out of here. Not because we're mean and unkind and judgmental, but because you can't have that in the church. It's a bad testimony. Stop it. You can control yourself. All right. You can't have that in the church. You can't do it. We've got to be not perfect. We're not perfect. But we have to be good representatives of Jesus, don't we? Okay? Now, uh, verse 12. Paul said, For what have I do to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? And his question is, is, has its answer in. In other words, Paul said, What business is it of mine to judge sinners? Isn't it incredible that any Christian would think that the wicked should be righteous? Now, I am for, as much as we can, legislating morality and being represented. I love in our country the fact that we have a representative form of government and that we actually have the right to say, you know what, it's, it's wicked. Listen, I'm going to vote against killing babies. I'm, I'm against it. And I'm going to vote against it. And I don't care if everybody wants to kill babies. I'm going to try to stop them. You understand? You know, I'll do what I can about it. You say, well, pastor, if they think it's okay to kill babies, they should be allowed to kill babies. No, shouldn't be allowed to kill babies. It's wrong. I'm against murder, even if it doesn't involve me. I don't want you murdering me, and I don't want you murdering anyone else, and I'm going to try to stop you from committing murder. Now, you say, pastor, this is an extreme statement, so I want you to understand something. As a believer, it isn't that I don't want to live in a moral society. I'm not just going to say, well, the world's wicked, so let's just, you know, <laughs> let's, let's be uh, libertarians. That's what libertarians are. Don't, in, don't interfere with anybody that wants to do anything. Well, no, I'm not a libertarian. I think we ought, to, we ought to restrict people from doing evil. They ought to be stopped. Evil ought to be stopped. I think for interfering in evil. But I don't think that sinners are righteous. In other words, I'm never shocked or outraged that a person who's lost commits fornication. Are you? Isn't that what sinners do? Commit sin? And the notion that I'm going to withdraw myself from them because sinners are sinful is ludicrous. They're just like me and they need Jesus just like I did. And Paul said, what have I to do to judge them that are without? He said, how can I judge the wicked, the people who aren't saved? And the answer to that hypothetical question is you can't. But then he said, but what can I do about judging people that are within? He said, well, I can do something about that. 
my friend, biblical separation is because we have been made like Jesus. We've been made like God. We've been made holy. Biblical separation is a reflection of the holiness that we've been given when we were justified by Jesus Christ. It's a recognition that I am called to be holy, I am sanctified, I am set apart from the world, and I am supposed to be holy, and so are y'all. If you're a child of Jesus, you're part of this body, you're supposed to be holy. And our biblical separation says we have to be holy, and if you won't be holy, we're going to have to separate from you so that you can have consequences, get right and get holy. In other words, and be what you're supposed to be to be holy. Biblical separation doesn't say get rid of that person forever. It says don't fellowship with them when they're sinning. And when they get right, uh, if you were to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, you'd see uh, the Apostle Paul tell him, restore this guy. This guy that got kicked out of the church, he got right. And he got restored right back into the church again after he got right. Now Christian, uh, if you will with me, let's read the last verse of chapter 5. Paul said, but them that are without God judgeth, Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now, this is a major help for me. Major, major help. I went to Christian Bible college. It makes sense because I was a Bible major. I was studying pastoral ministries and biblical languages. And while I was in Bible college, it was also liberal arts college, but there were, a lot of, there were about 5,000 students there. And I got made what they call at the time to be a floor leader. So there's, I don't remember how many guys. I think it's like 80 guys or, I don't know, a, a hall of guys that I was in charge of. I was the leader of that, myself and another guy, uh, we were the leaders of that hall. And one of the things that was our responsibility was that we were just supposed to make sure that the guys on our hall obeyed the rules of the institution, institutional rules. Institutions all have to have rules. And that was our job. And so they were supposed to go to bed at night uh, at 11 o'clock. They don't have it, I don't think, anymore, but that they had, you're supposed to go to bed at 11 every night, and you're supposed to clean your room every morning. You're supposed to make your bed, take out your trash, and put your stuff away in your room. And we checked on them every night. I had to go do at night time. I don't remember what they call it, but I checked. What is it? Room check? Yeah, we do room check. You in bed, you know, say goodnight to the guys. And, you know, if somebody wasn't in bed, make them get in bed. And if they weren't in bed, I'd ride them to merit sometimes if they were habitual offenders. In the morning, I'd check and make sure their rooms are clean. By the way, it's a good idea to do that in an institution. You know how disgusting people will be if left to themselves? And it really is just terrible. <laughs> uh, so I'd check and make sure they took out the trash, made their bed, and you know, whatever, did what they were supposed to. And then there were dress things, ways they were supposed to dress or not supposed to, different things. And I had to enforce the rules of the institution. When I graduated from, and by the way, when I, was, when I was there, it was like, if I told somebody, hey, you need to go back and change, one of the guys maybe was wearing something he wasn't allowed to wear, or he was, we, we had to shave back then. I'm not sure if they still have to shave, but we had to shave every day. And I'd say, you need to go shave. And they had to go shave. And if they didn't go shave, I'd write them up. And if they disrespected me, I'd write them up for disrespect. And they'd go before the discipline committee and something happened to them. I mean, they were in trouble if they did that. And then I got out of school and I started working with people that come to churches voluntarily. And they didn't sign a contract. This is what I'll do. This will be my code of conduct. while I'm a... Now, we do have code of conduct for some things in our church constitution. It's not, it's not anything like what you have to wear or anything like that. But there are certain things you agree to. You're not going to commit fornication and be in this church. There's things you're not going to do and be a member of this church. But I remember the difference between having to enforce rules where people had agreed to be under them. They'd sign saying, I'll agree by the rules of this institution. I'll abide by them. And then graduating and being used to, you know, you, you need to do this, you need to do that, correcting people, and then going into a world where nobody's agreed to be under any kind of authority at all. <laughs> I found out you can't really tell people that, that aren't part of the church to do anything. Now, not that I'm trying to be anybody's boss or anything like that, but I just had to kind of get this sorted out in my mind. And I've told you guys before about a boy. I was in a shopping plaza on Oakland Park, and a kid right in front of his mom is eating something out of a container, and he throws a container right in the parking lot, just throws the trash down. Does that bother you? Yeah. I, for some reason, it bothers me. And so I told the guy, I said, you pick that up. And he did. He picked it up. And then his mom looked at me and she said, who is you? Or who you is? And I said, I'm Ryan. And the kid looked at her, looked at me, and he threw his trash back down. Well, you can't make me do anything. And the reality is I can't make any, any person who is a sinner stop sinning. Can I? 
you know something else? I don't care to. I'm not trying to get wicked people to go through behavior modification to suit my fancy. And I'm not trying that at all. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to get people that are unclean, that are separated from the Holy God in Heaven, who have eternal consequences as a result of it, I'm trying to get them to see Jesus. One of the ways they're going to see Jesus is if I'm living the life of sanctification. If they see me and they see me represent Jesus and I preach Jesus to them, they say, well, you're different than me. I'm not different from anybody because of anything I can do. I'm different from a lost person because of what Jesus did for me. It's the only difference. I'm not better than anybody. I'm not different than anybody. I'm not above doing something. Listen, you may be tempted by something I'm not, but I'm tempted by things that you're not. I'm a sinner. Only saved by grace. Only nigh because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Only near God because of the blood of Jesus. I am no better. And neither are you. And we as believers need to understand that biblical separation actually separates us. We're responsible to be holy and we're responsible to keep the church holy, but we're also supposed to go out into a wicked world and be holy. We're supposed to go around the wicked and not say, you need to do this and this and this and this and this and this. It bothers me when someone who's lost thinks that being a Christian is because of things you don't do or things you do because they don't understand it's because of Jesus. There are churches that preach behavior modification gospels. You need to do this and this and this and this. Well, look at that. I mean, he stopped doing that. He stopped doing that. He stopped doing that. He must be saved. The Nazarene church, that's what they preach. You need to quit smoking. You need to quit drinking. You need to get rid of your tattoos. That's hard. You need to whatever, whatever, whatever. You need to stop doing this and this and this. You need to separate from that person. You need to... Okay, wow, boy, that person got saved. Look at all the things they stopped doing. You didn't get saved because of what you stopped doing. You got saved because you were made to be holy. Now, when you're made to be holy and God says, be holy for I'm holy, all of a sudden that's a command that makes sense, right? We're called. We're, we're supposed to be sanctified. We're called to be holy. We're called to be saints. Well, all of a sudden, the way I live is different. But I don't go into the world and try to straighten them out. I go into the world as a separate individual and preach Jesus. You know, there are a lot of lost people that don't like sin. Serious. There are people who are in the clutches of sin that hate it. No drunkard likes alcohol. You say, what, Pastor? No, they, no I'm honestly, no drunkard likes alcohol. You show me a drunkard that actually enjoys the taste of alcohol. I'm talking about a drunkard. I'm talking about somebody that literally their life has been destroyed by it. They've lost self-control and they've just got to have a drink. They drink the hardest, most <coughs> disgusting thing they can get a hold of because of what it does to them. Not because they enjoy it. They hate alcohol. But they're in its clutches. Can't escape it. They hate the stuff. And I'll tell you, no fornicator, no sexual pervert loves their perversion. They're in its clutches. It's got a hold of them. No thief loves being a thief. He's just in the clutches of covetousness. And my friend, there's a whole world that's lost in the darkness of sin. And the light of the world's Jesus. And the only way that they can see light is for us to be separated, to be holy. Not separated by withdrawing ourselves so they never see us. Separated by going to them as holy individuals and living a life that is representative of God's holiness in their presence. And those individuals, when they see you, will see Jesus. And my friend, they want it. Now, how many people that have said to me, you know, when I was young, I used to think that people like you, I used to think you were chumps. I used to think you were stupid. You just didn't know how to have fun. You didn't know how to enjoy anything. You know, I used to think that guys that didn't sleep around, that, that, didn't, that weren't in all kinds of relationships and didn't do this and this and this, I used to think they were just didn't know how to have fun. But man, I wish I had a marriage like yours. I wish, I, I wish that I could say like, I don't know how many lost people have told me, you know, I've told people, you know, my wife is the first girl I ever kissed on our wedding day. And I don't know how many lost people that have said to me, I wish I could say that. I wish I could do that. I wish, I wish that were true of me. Wish I lived like that. Why? 
because there's something cool about a guy not kissing girls when he's a teenager? Anybody can kiss a girl. Some girls. Right? Anybody, can, anybody can sin. Anybody can do something that's fornication. The Bible calls fornication. Don't go off on a tangent there with me, okay? Don't, don't, we're not going, we're not, that's not our discussion. It's just an illustration. Okay. Anybody can involve themselves in fornication. Anybody can involve themselves in wickedness. But if somebody doesn't, man, there's a glimmer of hope for people that are trapped by it. Isn't there? And my friend, you may be here this morning and you may say, you know, Pastor, some of the things that, that uh, have been mentioned this morning, I know you weren't talking about me, but some of the things you mentioned, I'm a believer. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior, and yet I'm not a separated believer. My friend, God's Holy Spirit can help you. But the first area where you're going to get help, that you, that you will be helped, will be if you just recognize biblical separation and the requirement for biblical separation for believers. But more importantly, you and I are supposed to be a help. There's a lost world that doesn't know how to live, that doesn't have hope, and they're in despair because they are in the clutches of sin. And believers withdraw themselves from them. The only people that could give them an answer and that could help them have withdrawn. And you and I as believers are not to withdraw ourselves. Oh, we don't involve ourselves in the wickedness. But we don't withdraw ourselves from the wicked. We go to the wicked and we preach Jesus. Preach in the right spirit. Sometimes it isn't well received, is it? You ever had somebody just didn't like you and you didn't know why and you found out later it's just not anything you did, maybe it's what you don't do? I'll be around him, he doesn't drink. Makes me feel bad. You know when you do right, sometimes you make people feel bad. Sometimes Christians are made to feel badly by other believers that are practicing biblical separation and they're not comfortable because it brings them conviction. And conviction doesn't feel good, does it? We all like the feeling of conviction. Man, I, I pray sometimes when I go to church, I sit and preach, I say, God, give me biblical conviction today. Show me areas in my life where I can change. It isn't because I get a thrill from the feeling of conviction. It's actually because I get shown by God something that God's working on in my life and I can draw closer to Jesus and I like that. I don't like the way I feel when, I, when I'm shown that I'm wicked. <laughs> it doesn't make me feel good. And you know, you and I sometimes have to realize that's the way we make people feel if we live a life of biblical separation. You may dress differently, act differently, not do things that the Bible plainly says are sin. And you may make people around you feel uncomfortable. But friend, if you have the right kind of a spirit You'll affect the world around you. Oh, there's people in the world that hate God. And they don't want anything to do with God. And they don't want anything to do with Christians. They're just going to hate you. But there are also people who are in the clutches of sin. And they need help. And they need hope. And you and I are to be in the world, not of the world, so we can help and so we can provide them hope. And the hope is Jesus Christ and the Gospel. And listen, you can't help somebody stop drinking. You can't help somebody stop fornicating. You can't help somebody stop being covetous. You can't do anything about it. You can't give them, here's a three-step program for stopping those things. It won't work for them. But Jesus can. Jesus can. Jesus can save and change any life, and I've seen it too many times to doubt it. I believe it because it's in the Bible. As God's Word says so. And I also believe it because I've seen God do it. I've seen people that you'd say, that person will never darken the doors of the church. And I've seen them... A couple of years later, a completely different person. I'll close with this illustration. I remember when I was in high school, my cousin was about a year and a half older than me, and he wasn't really raised in a Christian home, and he didn't really have Christian friends. I remember he had a friend that was a really nice guy, but they, the two of them kind of were you know, buddies and getting in trouble together. I remember a couple of times hearing about them getting arrested for getting drunk and getting into things and doing stuff and fights and that sort of thing. But I remember going to a funeral in our family, and I remember that that guy being there, and I won't mention his name, but I remember his being there, my cousin's friend, and he came and he told me, he said, you hear I got saved? I said, no, really? He said, yeah. He said, and I, and I married a girl, she's a Christian, and I'm uh, doing this in my church, and he said, man, he said, God has just changed my life. And I would just be honest with you, if I'd ever thought that that guy would ever get saved, I mean, I remember my mom trying to share the gospel with him, I remember being afraid to even tell him about the gospel because I knew he'd make fun of me. But, I mean, I'll tell you, every time I hear about him anymore, I just hear about how he's serving the Lord. And he's a wonderful Christian, a separated Christian. And if I had to ever guess whether or not that individual would trust Jesus as their Savior, I'd have to say never in a million years. 
the way they live and what they do? No, -uh, not possible. And yet, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. <laughs> I'm that guy. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't most of us, wouldn't we say, you know what, I'm not a good candidate for being holy? I hope you have enough humility to say that. I'm not. So I got saved as a child, but I'll just tell you, based on my personality and my attitude, the way I am, I'd never, I'd never be a religious person. And I'd, I'd be as wicked as I could be if I didn't know Jesus as my Savior. But because of Jesus, He that hath called you is holy. I'm told to be holy. And I can be. Not because I'm good, but because of what Jesus has done for me. I've gone on too long and to closed too many times. And so we're going to end there this morning. Father, thank You for what You've taught us this morning. Lord, I pray if there be an individual in this room that's struggling with the understanding of what it means to be holy, that we would be helped to understand that our holiness does not come from our worth or our merit or our behavior, but that it becomes comes really at the cost of the cross, the, the blood of Jesus Christ. If there be an individual here today that does not know Jesus as their Savior, God, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray for believers that are here today that struggle with this matter of not wanting to pretend to take upon themselves pretenses or errors or pretend like they're better than other people. And I pray that you'd help us to have clarity. We're not holy because we're better. We're holy because we've been made to be holy. But God, we also have a duty and obligation to be holy and in the world. Not of the world, but in the world. And so Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand that. In just a minute, I'm going to finish my prayer, but I'd like everyone to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment before we have our invitation. I'd like to ask a couple questions. The first one would be this. You'd say, you may be here this morning, you'd say, you know, Pastor Price, today you were talking about sin, and you made me feel really badly because you actually mentioned things that are involved in my life. And to be honest with you, I, I didn't even necessarily know that some of the things you talked about were even wrong. And uh, I'm still not even convinced because maybe you haven't shown me from the Bible. But I know that the Holy Spirit of God moved in my heart today. And I know that some of the things that you, that you spoke about this morning are things that, that God wants to work on in my life. And I know I, I probably can't change by myself. I can't be different. But the idea that God could change me, that's something I'd be interested in. I'm not born again. I, I, I'm religious. I'm, I, I've gone to church, or, and I'm here today. But I don't, I don't know that I have eternal life. And I realize that's a starting place. And so God's dealing with me about that. Would you pray for me? If that's you and you're here this morning, without anyone looking around and for the sake of others' privacy, we just slip your hand and say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm born again, but I know I, I know that's something God's working on me about. We just slip your hand up. I won't call you out or embarrass you, but so that I can know and I can pray for you. Would you just do that, please? Just slip your hand up, okay? Just slip them right back down. Okay? Second question here this morning. Pastor, you know, when the Bible's preached and when I see about being separated, I'm relieved. I'm actually relieved to realize that I'm not holy because of anything I do because I'm a failure. But I know that Jesus is my Savior. And I see this morning the importance of my not only exercising separation, but my going into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ as holy so that I could influence those that are around me. And I see now that rather than having an isolated, an isolated mindset, I need to just have a separated mindset so that I could reach the loss. And God's shown me that with some clarity today, and I'm going to commit what He's shown me to Him. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? Say, Pastor, God's shown me, and I just want to commit it to Him. And yeah, just slip them right back down. Slip them up, slip them right back down. In just a minute, we're going to have our invitation, and we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, give you a way that you can respond. Okay? Now, if you were part of the first group this morning, and you said, I don't know that I'm born again. I realize we've gone long this morning, but this is something that uh, that we need to take just a minute for. Uh, listen, being born again is, is something that's very, very simple. I just want to explain it this way. Jesus was God's perfect Son. He came, was born of a virgin. And He lived a life that was without sin. We're all sinners. The Bible says all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. I don't have to convince any honest person in this room this morning of sin. You know what you've done and God knows about it. And that's what you'll be judged for. And so... We know that all have sinned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that's what bothers us about it, is that that separation. The word death means separation. It means we're separated from God. And we're not holy. We're unholy, and, and that makes us God's enemies. But Jesus died for sin, for sinners. And God made salvation a free gift. Matter of fact, the Bible puts it this way. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Now, if you just understand that you're a sinner, that Jesus died for your sin, and that God is offering salvation as a free gift, there are a lot more things you could know about the gospel, but that's enough. I remember being a child and understanding that and praying a prayer that you could just say from your heart right now, God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that Jesus died for my sins, and I'm asking you to save me. I want to be your child. I want to be holy. And you're asking God to do that, not because of good works or anything else, but that you're just by faith just asking God to save you. You know God will do that. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and God will save you just for asking. If you're here this morning, you'd like to pray that prayer, would you do so? Would you just say that to God? God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know Jesus died for my sins, and I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. Would you pray that to God? Your own words. If you did that, would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I just prayed and I asked God to save me. Don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But I just asked God to save me. If that's you, just slip your hand up. Okay, slip right back down. Rejoice with you for that decision. You know, God always keeps His word. And He promises that if you call on Him, He'll save you. And it's not because of what you've done, but because of Jesus. We want to help you with that. We'll come talk to you about it, but I won't call you out and embarrass you in our invitation. Second part of our invitation is for everyone here this morning. And I'm just going to invite everyone to go ahead uh, and stand to your feet. If you'd open your hymn books to page uh, 397, we're going to sing this last song that we sang in our song service this morning. And as we sing the song, if it isn't true for you, as uh, we... As, uh, we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Then would you just do business with the Lord this morning? Would you just commit whatever it is that God has shown you to Him? And uh, maybe, you, maybe you need to just kneel right where you're at. Brother Taj is standing in the back. You want somebody to pray with you? Maybe have some accountability. Sometimes it helps just to tell a believer, God worked on uh, my heart about this, and I've promised God. And just to tell another believer so that they can ask you about it and help you about it. Sometimes it helps to have someone pray for you and hold you accountable. And so he's here for that. But as we sing, if you need to do business with God, will you please? I don't want to prolong the service, but it's important for us to have a time to respond to God speaking to our hearts. So you respond now while we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You don't need someone else to do right for you to do the right thing. I love verse 2. Think about the words as you sing it. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. this in the context of separation. Verse 3. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Father, we've enjoyed this time of being together with the believers and just hearing your word preached. And God, I recognize today that there certainly is no eloquence on my part, but the truth in the word of God is so uh, transcendent and it goes so far beyond words that a man could use. And God, I pray that this truth would grip us and we'd be convinced of it. I pray that every believer here today would know 2 Corinthians 5 and what the context is about being in the world and not of the world and going in the world to reach the world. And I pray that you would help us to live it and help us not... God, to be isolationists as believers, but help us to go into the world as separated. And I pray that you would just convince us of this truth and help us to apply it. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. It's good to, good to have an opportunity to preach to you. You're dismissed, but make sure to shake my hand and say hello before you slip out.